Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Knitted Art History where I am sitting telling you some art history stories while knitting and uh, well welcome to another video, a video about an artist as you can see as I promised in the last uh, two, three videos <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about my favorite artist and uh, well and today you know the, to the topic of today's video also will be a new information for me so I'll be learning everything with you because uh, even though he's my favorite artist you know but i don't really like to uh, go you know and research people's uh, biographies and stuff like that and uh, it's well it's not very right uh, in terms you know of art history because sometimes you can find some hints in one's biography uh, but uh, with him i just i don't know you know i never felt any need to read i just i mean I knew overall, you know, that he was a very calm guy and everything was... He had a pretty calm life. Not pretty, he had a very calm life. Uh, and, you know, for me it was enough to know because I was um, more fascinated about his artworks than... Uh, and I didn't really want to know anything about him. Let's dive in straight into our topic today and, well, grab your food, drinks, whatever you want. I am knitting another thing. Haven't finished the previous one, the beige sweater, but uh, I urgently need to finish this one. So today I'll be needing a black one. Uh, so uh, yeah, so let's get started. The character of today's video is, as you already saw by the name of the video, is uh, Wilhelm Hammershoi. And I'm sorry if I will, you know, mispronounce it. Like uh, I, I'm always. Uh, naming things on, on this more, you know, Ukrainian way, because I know that mm, with this pronunciation I will be able, you know, to give you the right answer, because I, you know, there's some sounds that I really can't pronounce, or they're not so distinctive, so you might get confused sometimes, you know, what I'm saying, so I, I'd rather say it in Ukrainian manner than confuse everyone. So till the end of the video, we're calling him Hammerskoy on, on this more, uh, again, Ukrainian manner. Wilhelm Hammerskoy, you see, he's a very <laughs> um, unique figure in in history of art, uh, in terms of his art, because a lot of people, a lot of um, art historians, journalists, whoever, you know, is interested in in art, they tend to put him in the group of symbolists, uh, but um, I disagree with that, and you know, and art historians who is directly studying uh, Hammerskoy, they also disagree with that. And you will see his works, you will understand. I mean, why a lot of um, a lot of art historians put him there in the symbolist group. But I, again, as I said, I am in a team of people who completely disagree with that because uh, those like who study him directly, you know, more deeply, they uh, say that. Uh, um, they don't see anything, right? There is no symbolism, there is nothing, and most probably that the artist he didn't even try, try to uh, put any, you know, any symbols or something like that. He just most probably wanted to just show his life as it is, in this very calm pace, and uh, without you know putting any like intellectual meaning to all of that, without any hints, without any mysteries and stuff. Uh, but, well, because uh, we art historian like to, um, you know, think about a lot of things and we tend to create some stories, we are here actually, you know, to to create stories because uh, I'm telling you, 90, like, 5, 98% of all of the artists they themselves, they have no idea what they're doing, they have no idea what they're drawing themselves, painting themselves, and uh, that's why they are, you know, when uh, when we're talking about the level of art galleries and stuff like that, uh, they are always using the service of art historians. So, you know, so we would write some concept to, his, to their art and stuff like this. So there is very few, very little of them who uh, are, you know, actually painting and in the process, in the moment, they actually have, you know, some philosophical, some intellectual idea that were put in there. The same thing might be, you know, with Hamas, where that... A lot of people tend to make everything <laughs> look harder than it is. Plus, you know, the thing why uh, there's so many, so much, so many, what is the right word here? Speculations about what he was showing because he was himself a very quiet and calm person, as I said, and he, um, he was not talking a lot, you know, so he haven't uh, left any actually 
uh, any documents, any writing, anything about his art and uh, how he explained what he was doing. So, our artist was born uh, in 1864 in Copenhagen uh, in a family of a pretty rich merchant. I understood they were not like super rich, but they were just fine, you know, they were not struggling financially. And uh, starting from a very young age, uh, like the main fan of Hamas Her was his mother. And she was rooting for him starting from a very young age. She actually saw that a uh, guy has a talent. And so, you know, so she started to finance him. And uh, he, his other brother, so, so Hamas Her was the oldest out of three killed, three children, oh my god. And um, one of the other children, I think his name was Sven, if I'm not mistaken, he also became an artist, uh, like uh, Wilhelm. And uh, well, and so mother was very fond of uh, uh, his, uh, her son's works and she was sponsoring him. He was, you know, she was doing everything. So the little one would develop his uh, artistic skills. And uh, basically, till the end of uh, her life, she was his manager also. And she was, uh, it is known that uh, she was so proud that, you know, she would cut off like articles from different uh, journals, from different magazines, uh, newspapers, uh, everything where uh, Wilhelm was mentioned, she would, you know, cut it off and she would put it somewhere to preserve it. So that's how proud she was of his, uh, of her son. And as I already mentioned that uh, his biography is not, you know, a very dramatic biography. It's not like we tend to uh, believe when, you know, when you think of like traditional artists that they have this lavish life, you know, full of adventures and up and downs and all of this stuff and full of drama and they don't know what to do with themselves, you know, with all the drinking parties and all of this stuff. Uh, he didn't have it and I think this is why he really speaks maybe to me why I like him so much because I really like more you know I really like artists that uh, are more disciplined more preserved and that are more concentrated on the art just people like that uh, that's maybe why I'm also pretty fond of uh, René Magritte uh, even though I don't really know a lot of uh, about Magritte in terms of his bi biography uh, and I, you know, when I was preparing this, I already wrote down a few names that I will be, like, in other videos I will be on artists. So there are already, like, few artists that I really want to talk because I really like them. And, well, I can say that I really like Magritte. Uh, he's, he's fine, just, I, I am just more fascinated about him as a person. You see, I have a reverse thing with Magritte. So with Wilhelm, I'm more fascinated about, uh, fascinated in his works and with Magritte about more with his personality because uh, there's little things that I have um, read about Magritte. That he was a very, very uh, disciplined person, you know, he had this uh, uh, drawing hours, he was always, everything was clean and he was almost like a robot and uh, that's why I really li like him and uh, as, a, as, as a person and and yeah, I must definitely will, I'll be making video on him also, but getting back to Hamaso, so as I said, not a lot of adventures, not a lot of drama, nothing uh, so he was a very, you know, by his nature, was a very private, very calm. Uh, as I said, I think I can call him a disciplined person also. He started to paint uh, professionally, as I understood, uh, starting from yeah. when he was eight years old. So with this period of time, he was uh, taking lessons uh, with a, um, with an another artist, uh, Nils Kierkegaard. Again, sorry for this. Uh, pr pronunciations of the names and so he was uh, this Nils he was a cousin of a guy of uh, Soren Kierkegaard who uh, actually was a founder of uh, existentialism in philosophy uh, I don't know if it will say something but well you know just side note like this in his teenage years he managed to get into Royal Academy of Art in Denmark and uh, there he was studying from 1879 to 1884. Uh, but it was not the, you know, the, the only place where he was studying because in 1883 he got to, the, uh, to a workshop, to a studio, uh, to another well, pretty well-known and famous Danish uh, uh, Scandinavian uh, artist, uh, Peder Severin Kreuer. 
uh, I will make a video about him definitely because when I read that I was like oh yes I remember you know I was watching some kind of uh, it's watching a m movie on him and I now I want you know to know how accurate this movie was so it was kind of like, like biographical movie but you know made into this more like artistic how do you call it right uh so so yes i want to check out how accurate it is but uh because i really didn't like this man i mean i would go crazy if i had him as a husband but his works though really like his works especially the ones um the landscapes with uh, women in uh this amazing white dresses and the wind on the beach it's like such a beautiful you know really beautiful paintings uh so um, so yeah, so getting back. Uh, so he was studying, I mean, uh, Hamr, so he was studying under the guidance of uh, Kroyer. Uh, and uh, well, well, you see under the guidance even it's a very you know, fuzzy word because uh, Kroyer, he was like, he was a little bit confused. <laughs> as i understood about so he he was saying himself as i found a quote that i don't understand him uh, him uh, hammer sorry he meant uh so i can see that he would became a important art figure important like a big uh, uh artist uh, thus i'm trying not to influence him and uh, we can actually see this in the works of hammer sorry that he really didn't you know uh followed uh, he really wasn't following the steps of his uh, teacher because if you can see i mean if you would see the the works of uh well let me, i mean i will show you you know the, the for the comparison the works of uh Kroyer and the works of uh Hammers here you can clearly see the difference right and and this is actually i think a very uh very wise position of Kroyer because um as i think a lot of you now and a lot of us understand that you know the geniuses they really like to influence everyone else because they think that everyone else around them is uh stupid uh so so when i was reading this bit you know i was pretty surprised that it was actually it's actually very nice you know and i think it's like the first time actually that i heard this thing that uh a already you know known famous artist was uh uh, really, really good skills. You know, he's giving space to development to a younger artist and not trying to basically crazy copy of himself. So yes, yeah, so things was like that. And uh, why this uh, working under the guidance of Kroyer was so important because here they were studying, um, they were studying the um, drawings of a life figures. They were also working on planners sometimes, and uh, that was the skills that Hamas who gotcha uh, picked up from his studio because um so I, I read a bit you know about Danish art because we in university we were uh we didn't even touch it you know we didn't even mention anyone so I don't know anything about Scandinavian art I don't know anything about um uh, how their art will develop and stuff so as I'm, as I'm saying this is also a new topic for me and new things for me uh, so as I read a little bit about the situation with Danish Royal Academy of Art in this time, so uh, so we're talking about the end of 19th century, uh, you know, there was some kind of changes going on because, uh, as I said, there were no live uh, figures, so they were uh, drawing just busts, just, you know, sculpture and stuff like that. Uh, and planner obviously it, it was never a thing in academies because it was, you know, something barbaric, <laughs> well, basically. But, a lot of young artists who were already in academies, they were actually, you know, not so happy about the the program of academy, and they started. They were not so happy, to, you know, to um, to draw just this historical uh, paintings because you see, in like what eighteen eighteenth century, end of eighteen, something like that, in a period in the classical period, uh, in the period of classicism. Uh, classic or like in in your English is like ne neoclassicism. So well, basically, eighteenth century, uh, eighteen nineteenth century, where where you know some kind of um, generous here hierarchy. My God, hate this word. Was established. So and the historical genre was like the, you know there was the highest, there was the peak of your skills. And uh, there will be, if you would, you know, if you would draw this historical paintings, you will get the more money and you will be like the most famous and, again, skillful 
uh, painter, after that there was um, portrait, and after that it was still life and landscape. So there was um, still life, it was something like, oh, you know, disgusting. <laughs> so not a lot of artists was doing this, this, um, this genre. And uh, and well, and students were not very happy in, in, in Denmark, in Danish Academy, about all of these things, because they were now more fascinated about the works of, um, about the subject, you know, everyday subjects, subjects of uh, work, of everyday people again. So they were just walking around, looking at the life that was going on around them. And uh, they were more fascinated and interested in showing this uh, instead of, you know, showing some kind of like, uh, again, this historical, sometimes even just fictional, um, fictional subject that was going on. And uh, thus, in this period of time, so Academy had this, you know, I was balancing like two places, so uh, two pieces, I mean, so this um, students were obligated to paint um, uh, this uh, like historical genre, you know, this uh, like uh, paintings with battles and all this stuff. But on the other hand, they were trying to find themselves and they were trying to uh, show more of the everyday life of their own country, you know, and preserve their, their, their culture, like, whatever. So, uh, yeah, so things were, were like that. I already don't remember why I started about, <laughs> about Danish Academy of Art, but, well, again, a little side note. Yeah, so uh, getting back to Kroer, uh, as I said, you can see that um, he really didn't influence uh, influence uh, his uh, young student and uh, and Hammers also he understood that he really don't want to work in this very you know decorative style in this very colorful style that was not his that was not his cup of tea he was not fond of that and thus we can already see that he started to work in this grayish silverish you know palette uh, with these grayish colors uh, different combinations of grays, uh, uh, blacks, uh, whites, and, and everything like that. So a pretty monochromatic, so we can say, works. The, um, the debut of um, Hamasoy was in 1885, so the year after he finished the Academy of Art. And um, uh, this debut was in the, in the royal residence uh, Charlottenburg. Uh, there's where the Academy of Art was situated, and he presented here uh, his uh, like the uh, the portrait. Presented a very nice work. I think you will agree with me that this is a very beautiful work. So we can see here a uh, a girl, right? So this girl is his sister Anna, and An Anna will be uh, another model for. No, I mean not another. She would be a model for another few paintings of his. Uh, so yeah, so this work was, uh, well, people was very fond of this work, they really liked this work, and that was, that was a success for Hammershoi. And here we already, again, I will, you know, point this out, we can see the palette that will be in, in his works, this is basically, you know, how he can, dis we describe Hammershoi with one word, just uh, gray. <laughs> so uh, I will mention it, I think, here that uh, I will not, you know, go uh, deep into analysis of his works and I will explain why. So first of all, when I was reading, you know, preparing all of this, obviously a lot of art historians, they are writing their thoughts on these works and just overall, you know, analyzing his uh, art. Uh, and uh, well, <laughs> to be honest, I disagree with all of them, with everyone, because you no, know, the main idea, the main thing that they were writing always that uh, he has a very this like um, melancholical. I agree with that, but you know, melancholical not just in any way, but it more melancholical in 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 more negative way. You know, and that they are very sad. Uh, very lonely, you know, and all of this stuff, like every word that you can use with this negative connotation to that, uh, like basically they were using that. And I I disagree with that like on 100%, you see, because I don't see, I don't see this sadness, I don't see this long, that's why I like him. Because for me, he has, this is, well, obviously, I can't also say that like there's a super happy word or something like that. Obviously, no. But this is just the way that radiate calmness, you know, the quiet pace of a life, and well, basically, what else you need, 
right? Nothing. The, and in, in these little small things, you can see like little, little, you know, happy glimpses. And that's why I will not uh, take any responsibility on myself to anal analyze his works and tell you that you can see this, like this is a, uh, you know, the interior uh, painting and this light is going through the window and this is like this uh, little light of hope or something. I will not get into that uh, because it's it's not true. I don't believe that, you know, all of these things that uh, a lot of art historians are trying to uh, like put on him are not true. I really generally believe that he was just a guy that just liked to paint interiors and uh, well he just wanted to show a life as it was around him and he really didn't need all this um, you know all this fast pace and he he was just there he was just happy he was his wife I don't mention it, uh, about her uh, and all this stuff you see this is actually uh, overall and the thing was, uh, I think, modern art, well, the end of 19 till like till the contemporary period of, of, of be period of time. And when, when I'm reading all of these books about artists, I, I'm really not reading the analysis of this because uh, of a lot of people, a lot of artists, because, um, well, I hope you will get what I, my point. Like, for example, let's take, you know, like Jackson Pollock. I really like Jackson Pollock. Uh, surprisingly, you know, I don't know why it's just his works somehow, you know, on this emotional uh, level, this speaks to me. And I also like uh, Rodko, for example. Also, again, I have no idea why. Just, you know, something with this play of colors is just making something to my to my soul, you know, to my emotions. And I will, as I said, I will not take any responsibility on myself, you know, to stand there in the museum and tell you that oh, the artist wanted to show this and that and, and like this because and because he used this gray, like um, brown colors that was he tried to show his uh, mood uh, and he tried to show just the, all of the weight of the world, you know, and all of this, I'm sorry, shit. Because the, the the art of this period of time that I told you, you know, the modern art, the modernist art, it is so individualistic, you know, because finally artists was liberated from all of these borders, you know, and they was finally free to do whatever they want, to do whatever they like, to, you know, to uh, maintain their own philosophy. And, uh, and thus you can really, you know, w look at the works of Picasso, I don't know, and, and say that artists wanted to say this and that. When there's, you know, when there's just like three, uh, I don't know, three triangles there like this, and how do you know? Consider it, and uh, all of us knew, know uh, how, I'm sorry, fucked up Picasso was. So most probably, you know, he was drunk one day, completely wasted, he came to studio, draw these three triangles, and then was like, I'm a genius, you know, like... I really can you know, you know cannot trust any of these things with modern and uh, contemporary art. I mean, obviously you can analyze, and and it's it's important and it's needed to analyze the works. But for this period of time, I think all of us need to, you know to put this little, um, like little star that this is purely subjective opinion. Oh, this is what actually a good word I remember that all of this art is super subjective. So there's no. Ob objective part in this and thus if it's subjective how you can you know place it as a single truth oh my god i'm sorry i'm getting blown away basically basically let's get back to the beginning when i was uh, a bit critical so i said what i wanted to say i want to analyze it because it's super subjective art because we have no idea for sure uh what was going on with Hamaser, you know, and what was... Uh, as I said, I stand by the idea that the guy just really was fond of peace, of quiet, and of his apartment. <laughs> that's all, you see. Also wanted, you know, to say about a little bit about analysis, the, that's where I was leading. Uh, that um, it is fine, you see, to analyze a work of old masters, for example, right? Of uh, overall just the uh, artists till like 17th, 18th century. Because to that period of time, they had an obligated program to follow. So as I said, 
the historical genre, religious uh, paintings and all of this stuff. So they were obligated. They wanted to be a good master, a famous ma master, a rich master. They needed to, to follow these uh, rules. See, so uh, analyzing works like this, they have some historical, um, like historical uh, subject, religious especially subject, um, mixture of all of both. Uh, some type of uh, still lives also. It's, it's very important uh, to analyze them because we lost, you see, a lot of knowledge. We modern people, we are not, uh, in terms you know, of our surrounding and um, everything that we know, we're not the same to the person from like 16th century, obviously. And it's the symbols that were popular back then, they are not popular now. Uh, some of them are actually pretty forgotten that was like uh, when I was uh, telling you about Bosque. For people in his time, most of his work, they were kind of confusing, but you know, but they had at least a bit of uh, understanding what was going on there because he was putting a lot of uh, symbols, a lot of uh, subjects that were uh, very common for like uh, for the society back then. But we now at this point, we don't know them. We don't know these signs, we don't know these symbols, we, uh, we can't relate to them. And, uh, well, not don't know, it's not the right word, because we do know, you know, as who said, like, our historians, as us, uh, culturologists, overologists, historians, we, we know, but we know that because we're studying that, right? And it's not just some kind of um, common knowledge that we're getting born with. As you see, it's, it's a little bit more objective. When you're analyzing works of the last centuries, uh, uh, I mean, the, the previous centuries to, like, 18th, 19th century, uh, it's uh, the beginning of 19th, even could say like that, uh, it is more accurate because we, we are analyzing this work, so we're just basically explaining you what, what is going on in this work. So, you know, so you would come to a museum and you would say, oh, okay, there's some, you know, this little guy who had the show in there, so this is this and that. Like, uh, or for example, you know, you're looking at the picture uh, and you understand that this is some kind of mythological theme, but uh, you don't really understand what was going on because you are not familiar with mythos. Uh, but uh, we, you know, as art historians, you know, we will come and help you and we will tell you, you know, we will analyze the work in terms of, of also, you know, the composition, the dynamics of all of that. And uh, obviously in terms of symbols and iconography and, uh, and as said, for example, uh, that you're seeing some, you know, naked women and there's something going on there and you see that near this naked woman is a peacock. And, uh, and we will tell you that because there's peacock there, there is Hera, this is the wife of Zeus. Well, I really hope that you, because, you know, I was, when I was preparing that I had a little, you know, conversation about this in my head and I sounded way more, more sane. I had way more sense, so uh, now I'm rumbling and I don't really understand that whether will you get my point or not. Well, basically, getting back to Hamas, I will not again uh, make any analysis, you know, I will leave it to you, so you need to look at these pictures and you need to feel uh, on your own what you're feeling and your with your emotions, because some of you may, well, agree with all of the uh, art historians, all of the art critics who are writing that he had a very sad works and they're pretty gloomy, so for some, someone, you know, they might actually be pretty suffocating, uh, but I don't see it. I am in a team of people, you know, who uh, I... This is how, for me, the the pure calmness the uh, and the happiness looks like. It is in these colors that does not irritate you, irritate your uh, eyesight. You know, it's minimal of things. Well, minimal of things. And now, yes, look at all of this, minimal of things. But I need it. I need all of this. Uh, and I just have a, a small space. That's all. If if you know if had I had a lot of space, that would be a minimalistic room. Uh, but well, yes. <laughs> uh, so what I was telling. Uh, yeah, and I think also you know the thing the part where I'm resonating with him so much is because I am basically you know trying to portray the same, uh, complete this the same mood in my photography, and uh, well basically. The difference is the only difference is that he was painting interiors and, I, and I'm doing landscape photography, and uh, well, well, I mean, let alone that you know painting and photography, uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I'm also I'm trying to show this more uh, gloomy days, uh, more uh, as one can say depressive day, days, and this is also why I had this thing that I will not analyze everything because. 
uh, I when I'm showing some dogs you know, to like my close friends and my family my photos that I was you know taking in a very gloomy days for example and uh, so I do everything on you know, the editing and stuff and I would show them the uh, already made photos and they would be like oh such a lonely weather you know such a lonely uh, landscape, such a gloomy, sad, uh, depressive, you know, and all this stuff, and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, this is not what I was putting into that, that I was so enormously happy when I was, um, when I was doing this photo, so that was, like, one of the best days, uh, for a while, you know, and, uh, just overall, if, there would be a place on, on earth where it would be always dark and gloomy it would be my heaven <laughs> i really you know and it would be raining and windy it would be amazing so you see so i find happiness in this because i find you know some kind of peace and calmness in that um, so i'm i'm in a team of people like that you see in, in the example of this photos you cannot really be sure you cannot actually put any at, uh, analysis uh, on modern modern and um, uh, contemporary world works because uh, as again to summarize everything super subjective works you cannot objectively analyze subjective work you see and uh, say that the things how you felt about certain works is the only way uh, is the only right way how you need to see certain works so this is I think this is the uh, minus and, and uh, plus of uh, modern and contemporary art is that it is so open that everyone can actually you know uh, find something for themselves find a niche in that and find something what they like um, but uh, on the other hand uh, it's a little bit harder to systemize everything a little bit harder you know to create a reliable uh, of reliable content in terms of books or something like that because as I said I was reading this analysis of Hamas and I was like but where <laughs> you know I don't see that and I, I don't agree like at all and uh, and I mean I have all the rights to not agree and uh, and they have all, all the rights to write what they wrote but you know uh, but not do not put this as the only truth so the people will also you know, go into galleries and be like, this is what he, what the artist wanted to say. You don't know what the artist wanted to say. And sometimes you are not getting even close to that. <sighs> My short, not short, so uh, I think you already understood that if you, if I'm telling, I will briefly tell you <laughs> that... Um, there won't be brief in any meaning, so yeah. So I hope you got my idea, and you hope what I, I, I mean, I hope you understood what I, what I wanted to say. Moving on, moving on, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We are in the year 1885, so I, I was telling you about the work of uh, uh, the portrait of his, um, the portrait of a girl, um, for um, the portrait of his sister Anna. And you see, in this period of time, uh, so uh, his works actually, the, the his palette, you know, his compositions and all this stuff, they were not so different from uh, from other artists of, of his period, from his colleagues. Uh, but somehow, you know, there was something in this work, this little um, like psychological side. As again, like we can just say it you know, overall, without getting really deep in that, because, again, we don't know whether he wanted to put any psychological size in this uh, painting or not. So this psychological part, it was a bit different, it was something, it was something different from other artists, from other paintings of the 1880s, and, uh, well, uh, the art historians who are studying uh, directly Hamas art just, they're saying that he was was this uh, ahead of his time. Then in 1888 and 1890, well, things got a little bit worse for him, so he was again uh, presenting the works to uh, Academy of Art, so they would uh, to the exhibition. So they were basically did, like pretty similar things like the uh, salons uh, were in, uh, and well, still is, uh, in, uh, in Paris. Uh, but uh, Kerem of Art, so they rejected in this like 1888 and 1819, in these years, they rejected his works and he was like, I think, <laughs> I, I haven't found any information, but I can just assume that quite offended maybe even, you know, it was like, what the hell? So he made a petition, <laughs> he created with um, a few others, uh, artists, uh, 
uh, his own um, exhibition, uh, which was called Exhibition of Independent, that was held in 1890. At the beginning of 19th century, he was um, experimenting a bit with his art. His works in this period of time really have this uh, feelings of symbolism, and he tried, you know, to combine this works, uh, this uh, symbolism with um, an Italian primitive uh, uh, technique of, um, of of painting, which is, um, as it was said, was very popular actually amongst the Danish artists in this period of time. There was the, the work like this was, uh, for example, Artemis of 1894, and we can see that, well, Compared to all of his other works, it's like it's not the best one, and I agree completely on that. But then next year he was experimenting a bit with um, more, you know, more this decorative style. So he was taking the works of Gauguin as his inspiration, and also it didn't really work out. So for example, the work uh, The Three Young Women of 1895. At the end of all of this, you know, commotions and in the end of this uh, searches and experiments, he. Uh, probably decided that, well, I have a manner already, certain manner of, um, of painting, and I prefer, you know, this not not colorful, not decorative, pretty minimalistic palette and compositions, and so this is how his um, style at the end of the 90s uh, established. He was also actually a fan of Whistler, another very famous artist, and uh, he, they had, like, quite similar works, let's say, like that. And uh, he was most probably, you know, um, so, so he, I mean, Hamas so, uh, had his own researches, had his own vision with this greyish palette. He took also some uh, inspiration in Whistler, and you know, he combined all of this, his own uh, searches, uh, the, uh, his favorite artist, and he created his own manner. And this is, as I said, in the end of the 90s. Uh, he um, established his style. In 1893, then, he got married to a woman, Ida Ilsted. She was uh, she was a sister of uh, one of his colleagues, also one of another painting colleague. Ida became his main model, so we would see uh, in a lot of interiors her figure. And also they remained uh, childless till the end of their lives. I think that was actually a very big plus for them, because again, you know, it, Children is not really, you know, getting into this atmosphere of calmness and stuff, and I think this is how uh, Hamas was able to remain in this like mysterious uh, uh, composition, this mysterious mood to his paintings. But also, um, this uh, uh, the absence of children allowed them to travel, and they would travel actually like a lot, a lot, you know, and they were going on a pretty long and extensive trips. They were traveling to Germany, you know, and he was right like um, riding from town to town, so they it was pretty extensive uh, um, travel. Same thing was was with the Netherlands, with uh, Belgium, with Italy. Again, absence of children allowed them, you know, to stay for a few months in different cities. Like he lived for a few months. Uh, in like in Rome, in Paris, in London. This is like the first fact to like this like little uh, our like coin box, you know, that he was actually uh, pretty well aware of what was going on in Europe, what type of changes was going on in Europe, and what you know the new styles emerged. Because a lot of people there, you know, you can assume that he was, uh, and uh, well, a lot of people they are actually assuming that he was. Uh, pretty isolated, you know, he didn't know much, he was not into art world, and he just had no idea what's going on, what type of changes is going on uh, in uh, in the world, which is actually, you know, first of all, pretty uh, strange, this is, you know, just thing that, that I just popped in myself, because how he uh, can, how he could not know that, you know, how you can say that he was not uh, aware about this, when Clearly, we know that at one period of time he was um, being inspired by Gauguin, so he clearly knew what like the things was going on, and 
and yeah and, and that he was you know experimenting with different styles himself uh, so as i said he clearly knew what he just decided for himself that he will remain faithful to his own truth to his own philosophy his own views his own aesthetics uh and not get into this uh you know this uh bavard uh, that was going on in europe with all of this decorativeness and color and, and all of this stuff and the fact that he was traveling a lot and he was living in the city so he claimed you know i think it's it was very hard even you know in in paris for example to live a few months up to like half a year in paris and not know what what, what is going on in the art world like no this is nonsense a little bit later after they get married um he and ida they moved to uh, a um to a street a strand head i'm sorry again uh strand head uh, 30 and this is actually a pretty well important place pretty important apartment because here he well he created a lot more than 60 interior paintings of this apartment and when as we can see you know there was a pretty minimalistic apartment with not a lot of furniture not a lot of things and he was constantly replacing this furniture all over his apartment and he would you know like replacing the furniture and his wife because you know sometimes you know she was like well basically not sometimes i, I am I, I do agree with this who say you know that she literally also looks like you know like a prop not like a an alive figure not like a live human being the most famous um painting from this apartment is the painting called last uh, modes dancing in sunlight that was uh, painted in 18 uh, hundreds again I, you know, I, I can see, uh, I think that all of you also have some analytical capacities and it also will see why a lot of people tend to believe that he was a symbolist. Um, but again, as I said, we will not get into analysis, so I mean, I want you to see it for yourself. What do you feel of what, you know, how you will analyze this work? I will not put my own um, thoughts and meanings uh, onto you. Uh, so after, in, in six year in 1906 he wrote another very pretty similar that was called a study of sunlight um, uh, study of sunlight interior uh, where also he like just changed the time of the day you know a little bit so obviously the quality of life uh, of light and etc so a lot of people uh, as I was briefly mentioning at the beginning they uh, tend to believe that uh, Hammersfoy was very leading a really private. I mean, he was, he was, but uh, he was not uh, isolating himself. And uh, as I said, that uh, a lot of them tend to believe that he was not into this art world and he was not interested in all of that. The head curator of the National Museum of Art of Denmark, uh, Kasper Monrad, uh, he he is actually telling that this is not true. And uh, these beliefs, they are made because they they exist because uh, there is very few letters uh, that were um, they were saved from Hammerser, his private letters, and even these letters. I mean, I could not find them because well, uh, I think there are somewhere in archives, so we, uh, they're not online. Um, but uh, so, so here, you know, we, we will believe to to the word of. Uh, uh, of Mr. Kasper Monred, uh, and uh, he he's like saying, pointing out that a lot of letters of his letters of Hammersfeld's letters, they are written in a very you know of, um, you know cold manner or like in this very official manner that you won't be able even to tell that this is like private letters and not something you know that he was writing to some authorities and something like that. It was not like super you know radically not like this. But this is you know about uh, him not being interested in art. Uh, so we uh, here um, I will make like a little side note. So I don't know like for sure whether it is a proven information or not because I you know in one of the sources I found that um, uh, it was it was written that. Uh, allegedly it happened in other sources it was written that it happened uh, but well this thing was like that that when he was in London so as I said he was a very big fan of Whistler and so he somehow find out where he lives and uh, so he uh, one day he came to to visit him to meet him to make an acquaintance with him but Whistler was not home 
and uh, well obviously Hamasur left and decided not to come back and that's why he never met his uh, his uh, like favorite artist uh, another thing also also that prove uh, wrong people who are saying that uh, Hamaso was not you know very social is that he had pretty uh, like a lot of acquaintances I think it's, it's more accurate word not like friends friends but acquaintances they were constantly going to different exhibitions with him some of the uh, some of them were writing letters where they like to someone you know, where they would describe how uh, they would visit some exhibitions with always Hamas. So, so as I say, you know, another proof to, uh, to the point that uh, he was familiar with modern art, he was just not interested in that. Just for your understanding, you know, there was this period of time where uh, a lot, a lot of these very famous and important figures of uh, of uh, important artists was emerging uh or some of them were already like uh, they were a bit older than Hamas so you know so he was he was creating and he was living in a period of time of Toulouse Lautrec you know of Van Gogh of uh Gauguin as I said of uh, Matisse of Cezanne and uh, everything 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 like that of Monet and uh, so so he knew what was going on yeah. he basically was like I mean Hamas who he basically was living in his own reality, some kind of his own parallel uh, world, in his own parallel chronology. He was more into, he was more inspired about um, a little bit more older masters, especially the um, masters from uh, Netherlands, like Jan Stan, like Adrian van Stade, uh, Peter de Hoog. About Peter de Hoog, I will make also a video because I really like his works also. The works of Hamas Hoy are pretty. For similar to works of Peter de Hoog because de Hoog also he liked this interior paintings and you know this uh, open doors, closed doors, open windows, you know. And but but again with de Hoog it, it's a little bit easier to analyze his works because we know the programs back then. He was very fond of the sim symbols, you know, the stuff. So it is reasonable to search for them because we know that it was a thing back then. Uh, whether with uh, Hamas or it's a little bit more, you know, a bit more tricky. Because of his, or because of this grayish colors that he, uh, grayish palette that he had, grayish silver palette that he had, he was, uh, I mean, Hamas, he was compared to another, well, uh, an almost, you know, to, almost we can call him a titan of art, uh, Vermeer. Uh, but I will, you know, mention a bit, a little difference about um, about uh, him a little bit, like in a bit. I just want to add here that uh, ironically, you see, uh, he, uh, at this period of time actually, he was a uh, well, pretty well-known artist and uh, actually people outside of Denmark, they were very fond of his work, they actually really liked his work. So uh, uh, we know that uh, Renoir, for example, he was very fond of his work, you know, surprisingly, right? Uh, the bright Renoir, but uh, he, he he liked Hamas his works. And uh, a lot of people, you know, art critics, they were actually very, very fond of his works and they were, you know, writing that uh, Hamas is actually the epitome of Danish uh, art uh, and he is like the best representative of Danish art. While back to his own country, uh, he was, uh, well, not really neglected. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, everything was so bad, but uh, it was definitely worse than in uh, all of the other European countries, in West European countries. Uh, he was not very, you know, people really didn't like understood him and his works and there was something, you know, something else. Uh, so they were not really fond of what he was doing and they were not very fond of his art. However, he was always taking part in a lot of international uh, exhibitions in the Danish pavilion. He started to participate in this exhibition uh, first they started from uh, Munich uh, in 1891 and then in 80, 1892. Then he presented also his works in the Parisian exhibition, the most famous one in uh, 1900, so this is, you know, the Eiffel Tower was built for this exhibition. The exhibition before that in 1899 uh, he was taking part also in the exhibition in Berlin in uh, also 1900s, 1904, 1905, uh, in uh, London in 1907, in Rome also, and in Parisian uh, exhibition he won uh, some prizes in Rome and uh, 
exhibition he actually with another five artists he won like the highest prize that you can win in this so so yeah so he was pretty well known in europe decade uh, of 1899 till 1809 it you know it considers to be the mature period of his art peak of his uh, artistic life and uh, as i already mentioned in uh, 1911 he 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 won the prize the highest prize in uh, rome uh, exhibition Overall, uh, the painter, he was working pretty slowly on his works uh, because, you know, one can think that those are pretty similar works, right? Nothing, like, there's not, uh, like, there's any dynamics there, like, basically, we can say anything, those are just, like, snaps of interiors, but he meticulously, you know, was painting all of the details in his painting, the light especially, um the shades and all of this stuff but getting back a little bit to you know the comparison with vermeer so um so they have pretty similar works like for example uh they have the work where the woman is um uh, is uh, reading a letter so obviously they're not identical but you know so the composition is pretty similar the idea pretty composition i don't know the idea I mean, I, I can suggest, but I will not, <laughs> but well, whatever. But you see what is the difference? So compared to a lot of other uh, artists, the when they were putting a figure, a human figure into their paintings, uh, thus they tried to create some kind of narrative, some kind of story in this painting. Uh, in Hammerser's case, uh, everything was actually uh, like in the contour. Nothing was actually really changing when he was uh, adding like his wife for, uh, to to his interior painting. Uh, she she quite literally beca was becoming just you know another prop, and th there's like basically nothing there. The main thing that he just wanted to show is how the shade and the light is playing on the. Um, on the sur on on his surroundings in the room and uh, on the person that he he put it in the painting well leading to Vermeer what I wanted to say that uh, one of the um, art historians so this is like not my word um, but I agree with them uh, uh, he said that um, compared to Hammer so you see Vermeer when he was putting this uh, like lonely ladies for example on his painting he was m making them you know make some kind of really similar and simple action instead of just you know showing that like a woman is doing something uh, he was also putting some kind of uh, uh, some kind of hidden secrets into the description of uh, certain actions and what just overall is going on uh, on the painting in some of the details of the paintings uh, like for example uh, you will maybe better understand so uh, I don't remember how this work is called I just don't remember it now uh, so there is a work uh, where the young man came to a young woman and there is some peeled lemons on the table so back then lemons was you, you know kind of a symbol of uh, wantonness something that you know of playing of uh, intimacy maybe something like that to put it like that uh, so by this peeling uh, uh, lemon we actually you know we know how everything would end so you know so this young lady she didn't reject this young man and well they would you know have the continuation to their story uh, while uh Hamas, he's as i said he even he, though he was adding a figure on his painting there were still no action there were still no narration there was still like no story everything is very still we don't have these feelings that, you know, something will happen, right? Because, and I don't think that he actually wanted, you know, to uh, put this type of meaning to his painting. And I really don't think that he tried to put this action and narration and that he tried, you know, to make some kind of statement with his art. Again, you know, getting a little bit left <laughs> from our theme. Uh, just wanted to add here that uh, this is actually a very, you know, rare skill to show uh at one point you know this still figure but uh, make the composition so perfect that you you know you will f have the feeling that uh well the, the painting will start to move in a second like for example like Monet he has a lot of works like this that's why I love him so much even though you know it's such a cliche already uh to like Monet but still 
he had this superpower he had this talent to put the dynamic in uh, you know in his works uh, where uh, physically you will not see this dynamic so you know it's just your internal emotional uh, emotional feeling that like for example his work i really like this work uh women with the parasol or like umbrella uh, so it's the portrait of his wife uh, with his son uh, camilla and jean and uh, you can clearly you know you look in this with this work and uh, at one point you know, there's nothing the only dynamic that you can see is the wind right so the the dress is uh, is playing on the wind you know the grass is also is a little bit uh, bent so you can see that some windy situation is going on but uh he somehow i i don't know how to you know how to analyze it in words but he make something with this painting that every time i'm looking at this painting i really have a feeling that you know that uh that camilla she just you know she just turned her maybe it's actually the, the angle of the painting actually i think this is the thing what, why it's given such a vibe that you know that she just turned around just to look at us and to check whether we're going or not and plus Jean is standing also you know a little bit like in depth in, in painting so it also looked like you know the, this little kid he was just running running he saw that his mom stopped and everyone stopped so he also he stopped and he he waits like when we will move everything's fine maybe because of that the, the, the type of composition you know the angle and the placement of figures but you really have this feeling that that it just you know it was like a brief moment so she stopped, she looked at you, and in a second she will turn around, she will go away. Uh, which is actually, no. Uh, I think a lot of you actually heard such a similar stories with Mona Lisa. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, with her, for example, I really don't have such a feeling, you know, that, the, that she, like, will move or something like that. But there is actually kind of like a little bit of spooky stories that, uh, like, back in the 1890s, uh, some of art historians who were working with, uh, who were studying Mona Lisa were telling that if you would stand there with her for a little bit more longer time and just stare at her, at some point she will start to smile widely and she would just, you know, she would like wink at you or something like that. And I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so you see, so things like this happen sometimes. Another artist that a lot of art historians are comparing uh, Hamas with is uh, Edward Hopper, uh, but we don't have any, uh, you know, uh, information uh, for sure the, whether they ever met or knew, uh, whether even Hopper actually knew about Hamas. So, part of that, he Hamas who had. Uh, well, maybe not like a lot, a lot, but he had some, also some young artists that were trying to copy his style and trying to, or try to work in, in a similar manner, but they were <laughs> not successful in that. Another artist, a lot of historians, you know, comparing uh, Hamiso with is um, uh, Jans Sandradam. That was a master of 16th century and he was... Um, uh, drawing some uh, cathedral interiors. The only thing that we can find similar is the geometry, you know, and this fascination with lines, because Samuel was very, he was telling that he really liked all of the lines and all of this, like, you know, like straight angles and stuff like that. Uh, but, but in terms of, you know, on, on colors, in terms of uh, uh, the spiritual meaning uh, of this uh, religious uh, meaning, there were nothing there. Somehow, you see, Hamas, he was able to create the um, the effect of presence in his paintings through absence, actually. In search of uh, a psychological subtext, uh, some of art historians try to compare his works with the works of uh, Edouard Vuillard. They compare it just in terms of uh, psychological aspects and uh, just uh, ideas, because in terms of colors and uh, again everything else, um, they are very, you know, two different policies. So Vuillard, he was living with his mother and with his sister. And the heroes of his paintings, uh, you know, they merge with this floor of backgrounds uh, of the wallpaper. So so you can see a very, you know, this uh, very interesting. And I actually want to make an here because this is, to be honest, this is the first time I heard about him. I heard this name, uh, Edouard Bouillard. So I, I have no idea, uh, like uh, anything. I don't know anything about him. So also, I, you know, I wrote down him. So I will make a video on him also. 
uh, but well basically you know the comparison also is going on that uh, the heroines uh, of his works were merging with the floral patterns with the floral background backgrounds of the wallpaper almost turning into this uh, lifeless uh, just objects like in the paintings of Hamas Harry. basically Hamas you know he was just he freed himself from all of this uh, uh, from all of these heroes, from apps, from the um, human's presence, sometimes we could see even the uh, interiors where he would get rid even of um, different furniture, so it would be just the empty uh, enfilade of um, of rooms filled with light, and he was just you know showing playing with uh, with the light. This led, you know, to, for a lot of people to see some kind of mystery in his works and this is maybe because, it, you know, we tend to over-explain uh, everything. Uh, again, you know, you see the idea just came to my head. Maybe because really we are trying to over-explain everything in this life and because, you know, we are getting used to, let's start from like, um, well, the, the the new history, the period of new, new time, uh, everything is needed to be explained, right? You need to uh, have some kind of concept. This is like the thing with uh, contemporary art, you see, why I, why I dislike contemporary art is because it's not about art, you know, as a, as a piece, it's about the concept. It's about this uh, stupid, you know, just paragraph on the wall. That, uh, you know, I don't think that this is really right when, uh, the, when you're coming to the museum you are not resonating with art because you don't understand it. Even on this very, you know, um, even on a just emotional level. And, and, you know, and also the thing about, like, uh, the negative reaction is also a reaction. I'm sorry. I, well, I disagree with it, on, like, on every level that I can. Like, I... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why it's very, very... It's very hard for me, you know, to... Uh, to understand and to like modern art because it's not pleasing aesthetically. I mean, you know, this thing like the popular modern art that, that is going on in galleries, in museums, uh, because there is plenty of actually very, very good modern artists, you know, that are working in more traditional techniques, that are uh, showing and drawing uh, more traditional things. Uh, I have a like, few really, really loved artists. Uh, and I, you know, I wish I was able to buy some of their works, but some some of them. One of my the artists that I really like, he actually creates such an enormous, you know, like there's meters on meters works that I won't be just even able to fit it in my apartment. But, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so I think this is why he's um, uh, he's very uh, like people are very fascinated with him because uh, they don't understand him, you know, and they're trying to. Uh, put their own truth on him and they're trying to explain him whether just to you know go there and just to look and just feel some kind of emotions you know and just feel this peace and quiet in his works so um at the end of his life he was um he was still pretty bad so he had a cancer of his um throat and uh, thus uh, because he, he everything was really hard for him and plus his health started to deteriorate because he was very surprised and very affected by the death of his mother so it made him a little bit weaker also and uh, thus uh, starting from like 1840 he uh, he almost stopped uh, painting like at all and, uh, like this so he lived for another two years and on February 13 1816 uh, he died. When he died, uh, his reputation and his fame is just, you know, declined drastically, so people kind of forgot actually about him. And um, just after the Second World War, uh, he f he was like rediscovered again, and people looked at him with a little bit different eyes, obviously, after two uh, such a grandiose and horrendous. Uh, uh, horrendous historical events, events, right, that we had these two world wars, uh, people looked at him a bit different angle and they started to study him, get more deeply into his biographies and, and all of that stuff. And uh, uh, and now he again, he is actually one of well, pretty expensive artists, so I even wrote myself down here a bit. Uh, that in 2012, his um, painting, either that reads a uh, letter, 
uh, was sold on Sotheby's for how much in London for 1.7 million pounds, which is the two and seven million dollars. Uh, in May of 2015, uh, some of private collectioners he paid uh, a little bit more than two million pounds, which is three point two million dollars, uh, for um, for the painting uh, interior Strat Strat get thirty of eighteen o four, and then so after two years, what is it, two thousand seventeen? Um, another also uh, painting interior with a what with uh, a woman uh, and piano was sold by oh wow six and two million dollars so you can see pretty pretty expensive artists actually uh, so and i mean as he should as he should an amazing amazing artist i really don't have words actually how to explain you and how to describe my love <laughs> to to him for you uh, so really like this artist and you know now when i first saw him a few years ago uh this is how i started you know to get into more this like gloomy moods in my photography so he kind of inspired me for that also and uh, when i started to do my self portraits also this also was the thing that i was you know tried to uh portray in me <laughs> so yeah really really an amazing inspiration for me. The life of Hamas was uh, uh, pretty much like his paintings in these grey tones, uh, which doesn't mean that it was very bad. It's just, you know, if you are a calm, disciplined person, this is exactly what you need, this is exactly what you will like. There were no really any, like, adventures. The, he was not really uh, affected by the war. Uh, they didn't have children with, uh, with Ida. Uh, so, not you know much uh, they were pretty fine financially so he was a stable artist he had a costumers he was popular you know he well basically had a pretty nice normal life so uh one can say that there is uh, uh, no visible reasons to you know to be in such a deep state of melancholy that he was in and some might say that if a uh, modernism had a depressive you know pole that uh, this would probably be be it actually but as i said already multiple times here that i really don't agree because i don't see any depression in this works i don't see anything negative anything sad and uh, you don't see any type of loneliness there uh, but again you are your own human being with your own feelings and i actually think that hamaser is the one that you know uh, that you need to look at his works with an open heart and not open mind this is everything that i have for today and i really hope that well you uh you would like this artist also yourself and you found something uh, interesting and beautiful today for yourself feel free you know to have a little discussion with me in the comments if you uh disagree with my point that you know about analysis for example and also that uh, he is not so gloomy as a lot of a lot of people tend to present him i hope that you found something interesting for yourself as usual this is the most important for me and uh, wish you a good day good luck uh, good evening good morning <laughs> time to go to sleep because i actually really i i mean like what is going on <laughs> like my last few videos like biggest part of this you know this little views that is going on there it was actually made you know people like people you were watching it at like like 2 a.m 3 a.m Time to go to sleep, really, time to go to sleep. Uh, so, yes, wish you a good day, good luck, and uh, stay, stay well, stay healthy. Bye-bye.